One of the most well-known rivers on Earth is the Nile, and with good reason. The Nile therefore looms unusually large both literally and figuratively for local people and species, despite the fact that all rivers are significant. It is the world's longest river. Subscribe to AWZ and let us know if you enjoy our video. The Nile runs from the African Great Lakes north through the Sahara Desert for approximately 4,000 miles 6, kilometers, before emptying into the Mediterranean Sea. It drains 3.3 million square kilometers, or nearly 10 of the African continent, passing through 11 nations, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Kenya, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Egypt. The map on the right is a composite of satellite pictures from NASA that ranges from the Nile Delta to Lake Victoria. The Nile is frequently referred to as the world's longest river, although that distinction isn't as straightforward as it may seem. In addition to measurement, it also depends on how we define each object's beginning and ending points, which can be challenging. Scientists frequently choose the longest continuous channel in large, complicated river systems, but there may still be some space for doubt. Only slightly longer than the Amazon River is the Nile. From the United Nations to the Guinness Book of World Records, the Nile is still frequently cited as the longest river in the world. Despite the fact that the Amazon River also holds around 20% of the world's fresh water, it is the largest river by volume in the world. Early Egyptians were perplexed by the Lower Nile summer flooding, especially because it hardly ever rained where they lived. Although the Nile is only one river in Egypt, we now know that it receives water from Rainier regions to the south and that at least two hydraulic regimes upstream control its hydrology. The Nile has three major tributaries, the White Nile, Blue Nile, and Adbara. Beginning with tributaries that feed into Lake Victoria, the biggest tropical lake in the world, the White Nile is the longest. Before arriving at Lake Albert, it leaves the Victoria Isle and travels through murky Lake Kyoga and the Murchison Cabaliga Falls. After joining the Gazelle River Bar El Guzel and continuing north as the Albert Nile Mobutu, it becomes the Mountain Nile Bar Al Jabal in South Sudan and is thereafter known as the White Nile Bar Al Abayad. When it meets the Blue Nile near Khartoum, Sudan, it finally reduces to only the Nile. The water for the White and Blue Niles comes from the highlands of Ethiopia, where monsoon patterns cause both rivers to alternate between a summer torrent and a winter trickle. The White Nile flows steadily throughout the year, while the Blue Nile concentrates most of its work into a few wild months each summer. Although the White Nile is longer and more stable, the Blue Nile provides roughly 60% of the water that enters Egypt each year, primarily in the summer. Nearly all of the 10% of the Nile's total flow that the Adbara joins in with after July arrives between July and October. These rains caused the annual flooding of the Nile in Egypt, and because they eroded basalt lavas on their way out of Ethiopia, the water they carried downstream proved to be very valuable. People have been looking for its source for millennia. The Nile was regarded as the wellspring of life by the ancient Egyptians, but it was naturally veiled in mystery. It would be for centuries as well since expeditions made by the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans were frequently thwarted by a region called the sub where the Nile creates a huge marsh in what is today South Sudan. Due to the river's mystique being fostered by this, ancient Greek and Roman artwork occasionally depicted it as a god with a concealed face. First to reveal its mysteries was the Blue Nile, and possibly even Ethiopia, according to an ancient Egyptian expedition. The White Nile source, however, was far more difficult to locate despite numerous attempts, including that of Scottish explorer David Livingstone, who was saved from one trip in 1871 by Welsh journalist Henry Morgan Stanley using the infamous remark Dr. Livingstone, I presume. 
Along with the well-known East African traveler and explorer Mubarak Bombay, Stanley was one of many who helped establish Lake Victoria's connection to the Nile after Livingstone's death in 1873. Despite disagreements about its location, the Kagera River flows into Lake Victoria from Lake Rairu in Burundi. It also collects water from two more tributaries, the Ruviabu and the Nyabarango, which flow into Lake Rairu. The quest had still not come to an end. The Mbairu Room in the Mogo Rivers, which emerged from the Rwanda Nyangwe Forest and some mention. This is the Nile's furthest source. The Nile abruptly swings southwest and begins flowing away from the sea after doggedly pushing north for the majority of its course. With its main tributaries finally merged, it continues north through Sudan for a bit. It continues in this manner for almost 300 kilometers, 186 miles, appearing to be returning to Central Africa rather than Egypt. It finally returns to its original path and crosses one of the world's most renowned and significant rivers, the Nile, in Egypt, but why does it make such a significant detour? If not for relatively recent uplift by the Nubian swell, these rocky river stretches would have been quickly reduced by the abrasive action of the sediment laid in Nile. This feature, first known as that Great Bend, is one of several caused by a huge underground rock formation called the Nubian Swell formed by tectonic uplift over millions of years. It forced this dramatic curve and formed the cataracts of the Nile. The Nile alters the Sahara Desert along its banks as it flows into Egypt. This contrast may be observed from space, where a lengthy green oasis can be seen hugging the river in the midst of the desolately brown surroundings. The lower Nile has historically flooded in summer, saturating the desert soil in its floodplain. The Sahara is the largest scorching desert on Earth, smaller only than our two polar deserts, and it's no minor achievement to transform it this way. The Nile also delivered a secret ingredient all the material it collected along the way, primarily black silt eroded by the Blue Nile and Adbara from basalt in Ethiopia. Water alone couldn't have tamed the Sahara. Permanent human settlements first appeared on the banks of the Nile around 600 BC, and by 3150 BC, those settlements had become the world's first recognizable nation-state. A complex and distinct culture quickly developed, and for nearly 3,000 years, Egypt would remain the leading nation in the Mediterranean region. Fueled by water and fertile land, it received a lot of foreign aid. Egypt subsequently fell under the control of other empires, but despite this, it continues to prosper because to the Nile. As the third most populous nation in Africa, it is now home to nearly 100 million people, 95 of whom reside within a few kilometers of the Nile. Because it also abounds in artifacts from its heyday, including elaborate pyramids and perfectly preserved mummies, it continues to reveal ancient secrets and pique modern curiosity. Without the Nile, all of this would have been practically impossible in this desert, and given the significance of Egypt's contribution to the development of civilization, the Nile has had a disproportionately large impact on human history. The Nile supports a wide range of species, including humans. Along its course, the Nile flows through and has an impact on a number of ecosystems. Closer to the White Nile's headwaters, the river travels through biodiverse tropical rainforests teeming with plants like banana trees, bamboo, coffee shrubs, and ebony, to name a few. Further north, it approaches mixed woodland and savanna with fewer trees and more grasses and shrubs. The Sudanese plains turn into huge swamps during the rainy season, especially the renowned Sud in South Sudan, which covers approximately 260,000 square kilometers, 100,000 square miles. As the river travels north, the floor gradually fades until it completely vanishes when it reaches the desert. Papyrus, an aquatic blooming sedge that develops as tall reeds in shallow water, is one of the most renowned Nile plants. The word paper is derived from these plants, which were also utilized by the ancient Egyptians to produce cloth, cords, mats, sails, and other things. As with its plant life, the animals living in and around the Nile are far too numerous to adequately list here. There are its many fish for instance, including Nile perch as well as barbels, catfish, eels, elephant, snout fish, lungfish, tilapia, and tiger fish.
While it still grows naturally in Egypt, it is reportedly less common in the wild today. A large number of birds also reside along the river, and the use of its waters is essential for several flocks of migratory birds. According to the WWF, the Nile Delta is actually a component of one of the world's most significant bird migration routes. In addition, the Nile is home to a number of huge animal species, including hippopotamuses, which were originally prevalent along much of the river but now primarily live in South Sudan's Sud and other swampy regions. There are also soft-shelled turtles, cobras, black mambas, water snakes, and three kinds of monitor lizards, which are said to average 1.8 meters six feet, in length. The Nile crocodile, though, may be the river's most famous animal, nevertheless. One of the largest crocodilian species on Earth, these live in the majority of the river and can reach lengths of up to 6 meters, 20 feet. Although the Nile has maintained its course for millions of years and has already witnessed much from our species in the last few millennia, it now faces unprecedented pressure from human activities all along its route. It is difficult to overstate the importance of the Nile to people and wildlife throughout its basin. It only has one river system, but being one of the most well-known and significant waterways on the planet, it has come to represent interconnection that is even more significant than itself. People depend on rivers all around the world, but if we consistently let them down when they need us, especially famous ones like the Nile, we might definitely expect the same behavior from them. Let us know what you think in the comments.